Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. What extravagant praise and what a wonderful, gracious introduction. I wish my wife had been here to hear that. I think it, <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm, I'm so impressed with the spirit that I feel here, the spirit of adventure and the energy, the vitality of the campus. I'm in a different church every week and sometimes two or three a week. And I really love what I feel here at Access Church. I like the sense of leadership and purpose and the, the energy. Um, I just respect and admire your pastoral leadership here so well. Uh, the Burns just do a great job. I know you're grateful to have them and that God gave them the vision for this church. Every good thing that Jason and Liz do here, I'm, I'm going to take credit for that, <laughs> you know, in all humility, uh, any mistakes they make, that's on their parents. <laughs> Probably the best thing, smartest thing that Jason ever did in ministry was to marry Liz. And I think the goal always is to marry over your head. <laughs> well, I, um, I appreciate your pastor so much. He and I have now traveled on two continents together and it's great to be here with you. I'm neither a prophet nor the child of a prophet, but when I see what your creative team can do to transform this school into a church, it, what occurs to me is when, when you finally have your own building, what in the world will they do? I mean, it is, what, can, what will they be able to do with that? I'm so excited, not just for what God is doing in your present, I, I am very excited for your future. I believe the best is yet to come. I truly do believe that. <laughs> Pastor invited me to come here and premiere this new book with you. I'm excited to do that. I'm happy to preach on it. The, the book is Courage to be Healed. This, this is the newest book, the eight, my 18th, and it has just taken off like a shot. I'm thrilled with it. I hope it will be useful to you. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak. I'm not going to read from the book or anything. Nothing would be more tedious than that. But I'll, I'll preach along the lines of the book. Um, but I hope that you will get it. Uh, I want to say uh, two things to you. One is um, the book is $20, but what has happened, the reason the book is exploding, people think of other five people, 10 people that they want. Oh, I need to get that for my nephew. I need to get that. So what we'll say is the first one is $20. After that, get as many as you want for $10 each. So uh, I hope that you will get all you want. The second thing probably doesn't matter to you to hear it. It's important to me to say it. I do not take one penny for speaking here, preaching anywhere, any book sales worldwide, product sales, uh, uh, all of those, everything, even the royalty payments, they all go straight to Global Servants to support our foreign missions program, in particular the girls' homes in Thailand and West Africa. So I hope you'll... So I hope you'll go out there and spend yourself into bankruptcy. <laughs> it's because it accrueth not unto me. Mortgage your house. S spend your children's lunch money. It's nice to be in a church with a sense of humor. You should travel with me. All right. Well, I want to begin this morning. If you have your Bible, if you'll take those in turn, if you will, please, to Luke chapter 5. I want to begin reading at verse 17. Uh, just as I begin to read this text, this is probably one of the more familiar passages of healing in Scripture. I wonder if you have had the experiences I have of reading something, you know, through your whole life. There was nothing new or unusual to me about this passage. I've preached on it. I've heard a thousand sermons on it. And suddenly see a word in it that you didn't even know that word, that specific word was there. And, and you just have the feeling. I always think somebody came and changed the Bible. Uh, and then you realize you've just been reading over it. And I, I want to read this passage and then come back to that word later on. Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. And it came to pass on a certain day as Jesus was teaching, 
that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. And then when they could not find by what way they might bring him in, because of the multitude, they went up on the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch. KJV translates it couch. It probably should just be blanket, a bedroll, something like that, into the midst before Jesus. And when, he, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto him, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. You see that that's out of place, right? Thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, what reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. And here he spoke unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. We thank God for his word. The word which I missed is a simple one. The word is them. And the power of, I read it my whole life, and the power of God was present to heal. But that's not what it says. It says the power of God was present to heal them. Why is that so remarkable? Because none of them got healed. They, there was power in the room for them, to them, to heal them. But something in them kept them from being healed. The only one that got healed was the man on the rooftop. There was some aspect that stood between them and the healing power of God. I, I, I want to talk with you about healing, but really from the aspect of inner healing. Healing of the damaged emotions. Now, before you dismiss this as relating only to someone else, we all deal with it. It, it is, it's not just someone you know who's really got challenges or problems. Every one of us deals with life. We all have gunk in our gears, just stuff that happens. Every time you're going on I-4 and some Yankee with Michigan license plates <laughs> cuts you off, you're thinking, mm, the Lord is my shepherd. and you get in touch with some of that inner rage, then, then you can find out that we, we all need healing. We're all getting well from something. Now, there's a theme in this story that eluded me as well. Not only the word them, but, but a, a thematic approach. When you hear a thousand sermons on the, on the man lowered through the rooftop in Luke chapter 5, they, they will invariably be about one of two things, and both are legitimate themes. One is the faith of the men on the rooftop. The other is the healing power of Jesus. Those are both true and great, right? But there is another thing operative in the story that eluded me for years. Look, this man is entirely infirm, crippled if you will. He lies on a bed every day. He wants to remain out of the public eye. He just wants to lay on his bed off to the side and someone bring him his bowl of porridge. He doesn't want to be made a public spectacle. He doesn't want children pointing at him in the marketplace and saying, Mommy, what happened to him? He doesn't want Pharisees and doctors of the law trying to figure out what sin he committed that he is so messed up. Now he's going to allow himself to be dragged up on the roof of a building. Then to remove the tiling, the, his friends are going to tire four ropes around the corners of his bedroll and lower him into a meeting. This is a high-risk operation. It just occurred to me in reading the story some months ago, what if they drop him just going up the stairs to the rooftop? Furthermore, when they remove that tiling to lower him down, we don't know the outcome. He doesn't know the outcome. We've read Luke chapter 5. He hadn't. 
What if they lower him into the room? This is the hardest audience. This is one of the most unique descriptions of people listening to Jesus. The room is packed with Pharisees and doctors of the law. The religious leadership of the whole nation, it says from Galilee and Judea and, and even Jerusalem have come all there. That this is the top intellectual and spiritual minds are in that room. And here comes this poor man lowered right down through the roof. What if they all say, get him out of here? What if they begin to laugh at him? He deserves what happened to him. He's got hidden sin in his life. Furthermore, he doesn't even know about Jesus. I mean, his friends have faith. Maybe he does, but he hasn't read Luke chapter five. What if Jesus says, hey, I'm preaching here. Could you wait? Another moment of rejection, another shattered hope, another lost dream. So at some point or another, his friends tied those ropes around the four corners of his bed and they looked at him and said, okay, are you ready? Now the issue is not their faith and it's not the power of Jesus. It's his courage. I believe that one of the greatest variables in inner healing is the courage to be healed, to face what the real situation is, to face who I am, to face what's going on in my life and to allow that process of inner healing to work in my life, to cut back through all of it and deal with the real deal. To allow the Holy Spirit to hold that mirror up to you and say, quit blaming your mother-in-law. Quit, quit blaming the world. This is who we need to deal with. When I was at Mount Perrin Church of God, it was a huge church of God in Atlanta, Georgia. One of the key emphases of that church was counseling. I did a great deal of counseling at that time. Now, the only counseling I do is with pastors in crisis. But I did a great deal of counseling at the time. One, one lady I'd never met before made an appointment. She came in for counseling. When she walked in the door, she was so angry she could hardly talk. I said, can, I, can you tell me why you're here? She said, oh, yes. I can tell you why I'm here. I've just had my fifth divorce. And all five men were alcoholics. All five of them, dead out drunks. She said, oh, I hate men. I hate them. That men are swine. They're just pigs. She said, I hate men. I'm sitting there thinking, lady, you've only been in my office five minutes. I feel like I could use a drink. <laughs> but it would take phenomenal courage for her to look in the mirror and think maybe, maybe there's something I need to deal with. Look, if you are at odds with everybody in your extended family, has it occurred to you that the only constant amidst all those variables is you? At some point or another, it takes not just faith, but huge courage to face the things that are inside. All the, all the wounded emotions that get twisted like steel in the blazing heat of life's furnace, particularly trauma. Not solely, but particularly trauma. I, I now believe after 50 years of ministry and life, and leadership and counseling, both receiving counseling and doing counseling, I've now come, become convinced that there are basically five streams of toxic poison that flow in lives. I'm gonna put these up on the screen for you. These are the, the five toxins. Certainly there are a vast multiplicity of variations on these, smaller tributaries. But I believe that basically every toxic river in any life falls into one of these five, shame, unforgiveness, rejection, condemnation, and fear. These are, are rivers of, of toxic flow that make our lives toxic. And the worst thing is they flow through our lives and into the relationships around, they touch other lives. Have you known people that were just toxic individuals? When they walk in the room, you can just sense something is there. I believe that whatever it is, it falls into one of these. Now, I'm not gonna work through this whole thing. If, if you want the details of all that, you have, you have to buy the book. 
preferably a hundred of them. Now, if, if you remember in the book of Ezekiel, it talks about the river of life that flows out from underneath the altar of life. Likewise, I believe that these toxic rivers flow out from under altars, if you will. I use the word thrones. You could say dominion or stronghold or power on which rest on the throne and from underneath them flows these toxic rivers that poison lives. Shame flows out of deception, a lie or a set of lies. Unforgiveness from an inflated sense of justice, judgment, that's unforgiveness toward others. Rejection rests in doubt about the character and nature of God. Condemnation, which we'll deal with in a minute, rests, oddly enough, you may be surprised, it rests in idolatry and fear rests in pain. All of these toxins flow out from under these thrones. So let me give you an example. Here's a man who goes into counseling with me and he is a high octane business executive. He's a CEO of a pretty substantial company. He's, his life is now in crisis. His marriage is hanging by a thread, his career, all of this. He has is, he is now come to counseling simply because he is motivated by the crisis. And he, he comes in and as we begin counseling, we begin to move back through his life and he becomes more and more resistant, more and more angry, fighting, struggling. You can sense something is right there. And then finally, months into it, the trap door springs open and out comes the horrible genie. And it was that when he was 14, nearly 15, he was forcibly raped, not, not inappropriately fondled, forcibly, violently raped. And the deception, the lie upon which the shame that entered into his body was this. The, the, this is the thought that came to him. Only a woman can be raped. So if he was raped, it threatens his entire sense of identity. So he simply buries the first, the word rape. But if you bury the word rape, then you're not sure what part you play in it. So now all kinds of other things enter in. So finally, he has to bury the whole thing, suppressing it, repressing it, pushing it back, walling it off, denying it until it seems to almost disappear in smoke. It's almost as if it never happened. The problem is that beast is still under the floorboards and the toxicity of all of that shame and hurt and anger is flowing out of his life. So he builds this entire mirage of inflated masculinity in sports and in competition and, and he, is, he becomes almost a domineering bully proving what? That he's a male, that he's a man because this threatening deception is pressing against the floorboards to enter into his life. What's the courage element that it takes? We had to drag that incident out into the public and to see him say the word rape was a shocking and moving experience. Why do I have to say it? Why, why do we have to use that word? Because I said what destroys deception is always truth. So what are the therapies? So we have the toxin, we have the throne. What is the therapy that pulls each of these thrones down? Well, the therapy for deception is truth. We know that. It's in scripture. I wonder if any of you know what is written, actually carved into the wall of the lobby of the Central Intelligence Agency. It says, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I'm not saying anybody in that building believes it. I'm just saying <laughs> it's on the wall. But it is scriptural, and that is the therapeutic approach to tear down this throne. The truth can destroy the deception, which therefore dries up the river of shame. Once we come to understand, yes, it was rape, what does it mean? It means that the shame is not on the victim. The shame is on the perpetrator. Therefore, it removes the shame and places it where it should lie. Truth tears down deception. When, decept when the throne of deception is gone, the shame, it be the shame begins to dry up. I'm not saying in a moment or in a second. 
But the river, like all rivers, it dries up until it's gone. Look at some of the others here. What about, what about fear? Fear rests in the throne of pain. Now, that's a, that's a fascinating thing. Uh, psychologists, uh, scientists will tell us that one cannot actually remember a pain. You can remember that it hurt, but you can't actually recall the sensation of the pain. I said that in one church, and one lady came up afterward, and she said, no, I, she said, you only say that because you never had a baby. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, you cannot remember the sensation of a baby. Otherwise, all women would only have one. <laughs> so you remember that it hurt. But therefore, what can happen is you create subconsciously a narrative around that pain, which may actually make it bigger than it was. So you live in fear that that pain will be repeated. So you withdraw further and further and further away, hoping to insulate yourself or protect you from the repetition of that pain. If you ever got hurt in a relationship, you ever got wounded, what you want is for you make that feeling of that rejection or whatever it is more than it really was, and you create an insulation around yourself. But that's not the greatest risk. The greatest risk is the imaginative narrative we create around, we create around possible pain. I wonder, this is a very youthful church, but I wonder if any of you have ever taken a child to the doctor and the nurse comes in with a hypodermic needle and that kid goes ballistic. Why? It's because he creates this narrative of pain around that hypodermic needle. They're going to stick it in my eye. My brain will explode. My body will melt. He creates this whole thing and goes ballistic because he has created an imagined fear around that in unexperienced pain. I, uh, I, I spent nearly a year counseling with an elderly lady in Orlando when I was pastoring in Orlando. Her son, who was in his 50s, uh, brought me in to do counseling. She could not come out of her house. She suffered from agoraphobia. Agora from the Latin word for a marketplace. She was afraid to go out in the public or be with people or crowds of people at all. Finally, it became so bad, she couldn't come out of her own house. Her children had to bring her groceries and help her with everything. She couldn't even go in her yard. And so I began going to her house and counseling with her. I started by trying to convince her that she would be safe at the shopping mall. And I didn't even make a dent. So I abandoned that and went the other way. I began to tell her all the bad things that could happen to her in her house. <laughs> I said, I know you feel safe here, but really, I said, this is not that great of a neighborhood. Anybody break in here and steal everything you got, kill you, burn your house down? <laughs> she said, uh, Dr. Rutland, are you trying to help? She said, this, this does not feel like help to me. What I wanted to convince her was there's no place where we are promised to be pain-free. That's not a biblical promise. That's nowhere in the Bible. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, not because I'm not in the valley, but because he is with me. So the therapy that removes fear, rests, and pain, we know the therapy. Scripture tells us there's no there's no therapeutic approach that's any clearer than this. Perfect love casteth out all fear. Why does perfect love cast out fear? Because we invite his love into the pain or the possible pain, not believing that I will have a pain-free life, but believing that his perfect love topples the throne of pain and I can face that pain without the crippling power of fear. They're all there. Condemnation. I'm, I'm not going to do them all, but let's talk about condemnation because it's so common. Condemnation, that, that um, not unforgiveness toward others, but basically unforgiveness toward oneself. Do you ever hear anybody say this? If you've ever said it, I know you'll never say it again. But have you ever heard anybody say this? I know God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. Do you ever hear that? What's the, what's the therapy? That condemnation rests basically in a form of idolatry. And it's the worst idolatry of all. It's the worship of myself. God says, I've forgiven you, and you say, I can't forgive myself. Really, 
I don't mean this to sound harsh, but who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? The God who spoke light into existence says to you, there is therefore now no condemnation. And you say, oh, yes, there is. I deserve it. You are claiming to be a more righteous judge than the omnipotent God of the universe. So what is the therapy that tears down the idolatry of self-judgment? It's worship. When I get my eyes, and I'm not just talking about singing in church. When I get my eyes off of myself and my own righteousness or my own sin, I concentrate on the righteousness of God and it brings my life out of underneath the bondage of condemnation. But all of these, one of the reasons that people are resistant with therapy is because they think they're gonna spend the rest of their lives in therapy. The goal of counseling is not to wallow our whole lives in the toxin. The goal of counseling is to produce a new life. So he doesn't just wanna deal with the therapeutic approach to these things. What's the end game? What are we after? What's our life supposed to look like? If shame rests in deception, truth tears down deception, shame begins to dry up, what does my life look like then? It's integrated. I can take all the pieces. I don't have to deny the beast under the floorboards. I can drag that thing out and say, okay, yes, okay, it happened. But I can bring that into my life and my life comes together. Here's a great verse. All things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Either that verse means all things or it doesn't mean anything. So what that healing brings to us is that I can say everything, anything that happened in my life, no longer can it hide in the closet and pour shame into my life. I can bring it out, get healed of it, let the light of God shine on it and say, okay, yes, it happened. Yes, it happened. But my life altogether is a whole, and God is the Lord of that whole. Integration, mercy, acceptance to replace rejection, what is the end game dealing with rejection? It's Ephesians. He says, you're accepted in the beloved. Who, who dares to reject a person who has been accepted by God Almighty? God cannot be fooled. If God rules you accepted, it's because he has ruled you acceptable. Therefore, who, tells, who can possibly tell you that you are rejected? All of these things work together to produce a life that is integrated, merciful. We can be merciful with others because we have stepped down from the throne of judgment and we leave that to God. We are an accepted person. We find balance in our lives because of worship and hope. This is what God wants for us. These things are not an end in themselves. They're a way to get here. Now, some people say they don't, believe in counseling. Every now and again, I hear some angry Pentecostal evangelist on the TV railing on counseling. Counseling is not of God. I always think the same thing. <laughs> you need counseling. <laughs> I went through counseling. I, I said that to a group of ministers one time. I, I said, I, I went through counseling. There was an audible gasp in the room. <laughs> Afterward, a minister came up to me with this kind of secretive thing. He said, why did you go to counseling? I said, because I needed it. <laughs> At some point or another, just to face the fact, we're all getting well from something. We've all, life just beats the living daylights out of you. And at some point or another, we just need help. Look, then there is the challenge about counseling. Why do, why do I need a human? What about just going to the altar? What about just praying? What about just another revival? What about just being slain in the spirit? What about seeking a fresh move of the Holy Spirit? All of those things are good, but they only do what they do. Salvation is wonderful, isn't it? But it does what it does. Baptism of the Holy Spirit does what it does. But if we come for physical healing, someone physical, a human being anoints you with oil and lays hands on you, the healing power of Jesus flowing through a human being for physical healing. In the same way, Jesus is called in Scripture the Wonderful Counselor. So why couldn't his wonderful counsel flow through a human instrument to bring us out of the 
out of the emotional and psychological damage that we need healing from. The third thing is this, and I hate to say this, it's kind of discouraging. Not everybody wants you well. There are people that need your affliction to make them feel good about themselves. There are other people that don't want you healed, they want you punished. We, we have an obsession in the church for public humiliation that rivals crucifixions. There are people that don't want you well. They want you destroyed. Listen to Dr. Mark. If you don't hear anything else I say today, will you hear this? Jesus wants you well. Jesus wants you well. The final objection is this. People say, well, Jesus didn't do inner healing. Jesus didn't do counseling. Well, yes, he did. First of all, we just read it in, in Luke chapter 5. The man is lowered through the rooftop. Everybody in the room is thinking of physical healing. The people on the rooftop, probably the man on the bed, and all of those Pharisees and doctors of the law are thinking only of one thing, physical healing, what is obvious. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. He knew that that particular man could not receive or sustain a physical miracle until he received healing from the condemnation that was inside of him. He needed to hear a delivering word, your sins are forgiven. There is a better example, a greater example of inner healing and a counseling session, if you will, that Jesus did with Simon Peter. John chapter 21, following the resurrect, following the crucifixion, the disciples are pretty shattered. You want to talk about damaged emotions? It's all gone south. Everything has just collapsed. They thought they had the stairway to the stars and all they got was the elevator shaft. They thought they had the Messiah. He's dead. Some people think he's alive. Some people think he's dead. They're afraid. They're afraid they're going to be arrested. One of their friends has hanged himself, committed himself because of condemnation that he never got free of. He's hanged himself. And their big leader, their top guy, Simon Peter, has turned out to be a craven, gutless little rat. So they're shattered. So Peter says, I'm going back to Galilee and I'm going fishing. And they say, we're coming with you. They fish all night and catch nothing. In the morning, a man on the beach says, throw the net on the right side and you'll catch. So for some reason, they do that. And when they pull the nets up, it's filled with fish, which is a recreation of the moment when he first met them and called them. Henceforth, I will make you fishers of men. So Jesus takes them back in their memories to recreate the memory and then enters it with his healing love. And John recognizes Jesus in the moment and he says, that's Jesus. And Peter does the most amazing thing. He jumps in the lake. Maybe other people don't see things funny in the Bible. I think that's a scream. As Jesus, Peter said, oh, okay. <laughs> I know the other disciples said, well. So they're rowing the boat to shore and Peter swims ashore. Why? I can tell you why. Because nobody wants to get a tongue lashing in public. He wants to get there first and let Jesus vent on him before the others get there. He knows what Jesus is going to say. You craven, gutless little brat. I told you you'd deny me three times. The third time you cursed, I heard every word you said. So everybody else gets breakfast. Sit over there on that rock. <laughs> Instead... The Bible says, as Peter approaches, he sees Jesus. It's very careful to describe it. Jesus is sitting by a charcoal fire. He's drenched wet with cold lake water at dawn. He comes forward and puts his hands out toward that charcoal fire and looks across the fire right into Jesus' eyes. It is a recreation of Peter's darkest moment. There is only one other place in the whole New Testament where charcoal fire is mentioned. It's in Caiaphas' courtyard, the night that Peter warmed his hands and denied Jesus. The third time he denies Jesus, the cock crows, and they lead Jesus across the courtyard, and with his hands across a charcoal fire, their eyes meet. Jesus recreates that scene, takes him back to the moment of his darkest failure, not to condemn him, but to enter into it and set him free. He says, I saw it. Here it is. I want you to look at it, but I'm still here. 
before Peter can make any plea for forgiveness or anything else, Jesus says, let's have breakfast. I saw a survey some years ago. It was put out by a magazine and they ask Americans, thousands and thousands of Americans, what do you most enjoy hearing someone else say to you? They took all the thousands of answers and came up with the top three. I guess the first one. I know you can too. What do, what America, we're obsessed with it. What do we want to hear somebody say to us? I love you. I love you. The second one shocked me. Do you know what it was? I forgive you. We want to hear somebody say, I forgive you. We walk around with a load of condemnation and we don't know what to do with it. I believe you could stand on a street corner in downtown Lakeland and when people walk by, you could say, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I think people would stop and say, thanks, man. I'll never do it again. <laughs> the third one handed me a laugh. Do you know what it was? Supper's ready. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I was sitting there reading that and I laughed just like you did when suddenly it hit me. I said, OMG. <laughs> That's the whole law and the prophets. That's the whole thing. That's the gospel. Pastor Burns, every time you stand behind the communion altar and offer those sacred elements to people, you really only have one proclamation to make. Hear, O Israel. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jesus says to you, I love you. I forgive you. Come and dine, the master calleth. Come and dine. Jesus wants you well. Let's pray together. If you bow your heads and close your eyes. I just want to have a prayer for you. I'm not, this is not the kind of message to which one gives an altar call or something. I want to pray for you. But if you would say, Dr. Mark, will you please pray for me? I need to get weller. I've got some stuff I need to deal with. I need to get this out of my life. Will you pray for me that God will help me and heal me? Lift your hand up right where you are and take it right back down. So many, so many, of course, of course. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will enter into every heart, life, mind, and every damaged emotion with your healing grace. I believe you for it, God. Take us further in, higher up. Save us and we shall be saved. Heal us and we shall be healed. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and God bless Access Church. Thank you so much. Come on, can we show Dr. Rutland our love? What a beautiful message, everybody. Man, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Hey, stay standing for just a moment. My prayer is, is that that really becomes the bow on the message series that we just concluded last week. Uh, shame off you, that you can walk in healing and that Jesus wants you to be made well. What a beautiful, beautiful story of God's love for us. In a moment, I'm gonna dismiss you, but I wanna encourage you, on your way out, man, get a copy of Dr. Rutland's book. It is a game changer, and I really do believe that you serve a God who wants you to be well, physically, emotionally, spiritually. He wants you to be whole, integrated, not disintegrated, but integrated. What a beautiful way for us to do that by diving into this together. Let me pray a blessing over you, then I'm gonna dismiss you to go out and walk in this wholeness and this healing. God, we love you. Thank you so much for Dr. Rutland and that amazing word that he brought to us. God, I pray you'll continue to bless him and his ministry here in America and around the world with the efforts that he has. Bless him tremendously. God, we love you and we just want to receive that word. May you heal us and may we walk in that new life, that goal kind of life that Dr. Rutland just described. Thank you for it, God. May we have the courage to be healed in Jesus' name. And God, bless the Dallas Cowboys as they defeat the New Orleans Saints tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. We'll see you back here next Sunday, everybody.